Good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, CMCC seminar or webinar for those who are attending uh, via the web. Uh, my name is uh, Silvio Gualdi and I'm uh, uh, the director of uh, the Climate Simulation and Prediction Division at uh, CMCC. And today here, um, I'm the moderator of uh, this uh, seminar, so I will have the privilege to introduce the speaker, Professor Hans von Storch, and the discussion, Professor Roberto Pastres. Uh, but uh, before, before to do so, uh, just let me say a few words about uh, CMCC for those that uh, don't know the center. CMCC is a non-profit research organization established in 2005 which became a foundation in 2015. And the center is uh, uh, dedicated to interdisciplinary research on uh, climate and its interaction with the environment, the society, the world of business and uh, policy makers. The center is, uh, uh, the center is uh, organized in the form of uh, a network uh, distributed uh, throughout the country uh, with locations in uh, Lecce, where there is the headquarter, um, then uh, Bologna, Capua, uh, Milano, Sassari, Venezia, and uh, Viterbo. This uh, network uh, involves uh, um, and connects uh, public and uh, private entities working together on multidisciplinary studies on, um, in the field of uh, climate sciences. And uh, mm, the, the scientific activity of CMCC are distributed among nine research divisions that uh, you see listed in, uh, in the slides. And uh, these divisions share different knowledge and skills uh, that are brought together to, um, to provide an integrated approach uh, to, the climate, um, to the climate problem. Um, uh, last uh, but not least, CMCC carries out a number of outreach activities such as education programs, seminars and webinars like this today, events and communication activity for the public at large. And um, if you want to, um, to find more information about CMCC and its activity, you are uh, warmly invited to, to visit our website, which is www.cmcc.it. Uh, finally, a few words uh, about um, uh, how the webinar works, um, especially for those that, that are connected via the web. If you want to ask uh, questions, uh, you should use the, the chat room, uh, typing your question that uh, then I will read uh, to, um, to the speaker and to the rest of the audience. Uh, of course, for the people here, it's just enough to, to raise hand. Uh, now, um, few words about the speaker. So it's, uh, um, it's really a great, great pleasure for me uh, to be here today introducing Professor Han von Stork. And I'm also a bit nervous about that. And it's not only because uh, Hans has been my PhD supervisor at the Max Planck Institute and Hamburg University, but also because he is certainly one of the most important and uh, outstanding uh, personalities in the field of uh, climate sciences. Um, here, we don't have enough time to go through uh, or even summarize his careers and all of his scientific achievements and his extraordinary contribution to the climate research. I will limit myself just uh, um, uh, recalling that from uh, 1987 to, to, uh, to 1995, um, he was senior scientist at the Max Planck Institute uh, uh, for uh, meteorology in Hamburg, leading the statistical analysis and modeling group uh, in the division uh, led by, directed by Professor Klaus Hasselmann. Uh, therefore, Hans was uh, one of those uh, leading uh, scientists at MPI uh, that uh, um, during the 80s and early 90s made uh, uh, the golden age of uh, this institute, uh, leading the Max Planck Institute to be one of the leading top leading international uh, research center in the field of uh, climate sciences. Afterwards, from 1990, uh, 1996 to 2015, Hans was the director of the Institute of Coastal Research 
at the GKSS Research Center, now Helmut Center Guest Act, and professor at the Meteorological Institute uh, of uh, the University of Hamburg. Um, beside uh, his uh, um, um, huge uh, scientific contribution, uh, um, Hans, uh, in, in, in the recent years, has produced also a number of very interesting and stimulating works uh, and pub publications about uh, practice of climate science and uh, its interaction with public media and politics, uh, framing uh, his analysis, this analysis, in the context uh, um, of the concept of uh, uh, the post-normal science. And I think this will be part also of uh, uh, his uh, presentation today. Um, now, um, a few words about uh, Professor Roberto Pastres. Uh, he is associate professor of environmental chemistry at the Department of uh, Environmental Science, Informatics and Statistics at the University of Foscari in Venice. Um, Roberto graduated with honors in industrial chemistry in 1987 and got a PhD in chemical sciences in 1991. Then he started his academic career uh, in 1993 and became associate professor uh, at the science faculty uh, here in Venice in 2000. Uh, he currently teaches physical chemistry and mathematical tools for environmental scientists to environmental science students. Uh, since 1987, his research activity has mainly concerned the development of mathematical models for the analysis of transport, uh, chemical and biological processes in coastal water bodies. Uh, more recently, his scientific interests have turned towards the modeling for investigating bioaccumulation processes and substantial, uh, sustainable aquaculture. So now I stop here and I leave the floor to uh, Professor Hans von Stockholm. Thank you. So how do I start this now? Uh, I think we we'll just go. Ah, yeah, hello. So I'm not used to give talks while sitting, but people told me this would be better for those people I don't see behind the camera. There. So I hope I can do that. So I just came to my mind that probably the first word of my presentation is wrong, because I wrote the political dimension, maybe it should be a political dimension. And so this starts with a, I will start with a quote of uh, Professor Weingart. Uh, which I'm reading from this transparency is here. There are two paradoxes form the nucleus of problems of scientific expertise and policy making. The first is the simultaneous scientification of politics and the politicization of science. This has destructive effects. The increased use of scientific expertise by policy makers has not increased the degree of certainty. In fact, that has become a key this, this gives rise to the second paradox. To despite the loss of authority of scientific expertise, policy makers do not abandon their reliance on existing devices or arrangements. Nor do the scholars affect the ideas of science in the very strict form. So, therefore, why is Professor Weinberg? Second, I think that's loved. So, if you were to honor myself, so I'm showing here a number of books which I have for and I have two leads to demonstrate the So I'm going to show you the thing since 1972, which is relatively long. I'm dealing mostly with those for the time, that means salt, 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 and salt, and salt, and salt, and salt, and and salt, and I was director of the Institute of Policy Research at the Hamilton Center at Vienna. I was, or maybe I still am, not quite sure, professor at the University of Hamburg and at the University, at the Ocean University of China. Maybe a little bit special is um, that I'm also a member of the faculty of social sciences at the University of Hamburg. So this is a little bit uncommon to be a member in two faculties, namely social sciences and uh, national sciences. I'm the editor in chief of the Oxford University Press, a research encyclopedia on climate science, and I've done a few other things with the IPCC and our original version. Two something, right? Oh, here, James, is it there? Yeah, 
Okay, so an overview. Uh, so I will first speak a little about science and society and come to the issues, the kudos norms of Merton and the concept Klima Falle, that's a German word of myself and my co-author Werner Kraus, who is in ethnology. Then I will speak about uh, the knowledge market. On this market, there's a competition and who is the, um, the, who is in that market. There's the present scientific construction. There is the dominant present cultural construction, which is the climate catastrophe. Okay. Then there are other cultural constructions, for instance, nature strikes back. Then what skeptics say, and finally, even though there's not direct order here, outdated scientific constructions. Then we come again to the issue of science in society and the issue of post-normality. And finally, if I have enough time, the topology of political and journalistic utility. By the way, uh, quite a few of you have been so kind to respond to uh, the questionnaire, which I have distributed through uh, Silvio. And uh, if there's enough time, I will show some results at the very end of what came out. So the issue today is the interaction of society, that means public policy making and management, um, economy and media, and science. How do they interact with each other? And at the beginning, there must be a simple statement, which is often considered an insult by physicists, namely, science is a social process. Scientists are social actors. But science is usually considered special in its ability to correctly deconstruct, analyze, and describe complex phenomena. Now, how much do climate science and society steer each other? How independent are the different social spheres of people and concepts? What does society expect from climate science? Which function should climate science have? Should it be something like a state-funded Greenpeace? Or elite circles based on conservative views and traditions? Or kudos guided honest growth? I will not give an answer. Now let's start with Merton's norms, which he wrote down in 1942. And this is abbreviated kudos because of the four properties. The first is communalism, sometimes also called communism for some reason. That is, we agree that there's a common ownership of scientific discovery. I give uh, my intellectual properties right, rights up in exchange for recognition and esteem. The result which I have generated does not belong me. I have not control what will be done with that. In particular, I am not the owner of interpretation. If somebody inter interprets it in a different way, that's okay. Second is university. According to which claims to truth are evaluated in terms of universal and impersonal criteria, not on the basis of race, class, gender, religion, and nationality. British do not do better science than Albanians, to make it simple. Males do not do better science than females. And it's up thing. It does not matter who has done it. Disinterestedness. Scientists, when presenting their work publicly, publicly, should do so without any prejudice and personal values and do so in an impersonal manner. A statement like I cannot say it because it will be misused, is in conflict with this norm. And finally, organized skepticism. All ideas must be tested and subject to rigorous structured community scrutiny. This was all formulated in 1942, long before we had any conflict about environmental issues at all. Obviously, these norms are often violated. Science does not follow comprehensively these rules, but climate scientists accept the norm as normative guidelines. We think we should. The data of an online survey of climate scientists suggests that while kudos remains the overall guiding moral principles, they are not fully endorsed or present in the conduct of climate scientists. I guess nobody will be surprised. Now, the next concept is the Klima Falle, the climate trap. And uh, so this is uh, a trap for both society and science. Now, let's first talk about the society. 
Society pursues a normative goal, but perceives this goal as a scientifically legitimized imperative, namely that we must build the climate protection policy, that we must follow the Paris goal of maximum 1.5 or 2 degrees warming at the end of the 21st century as a scientific necessity, not as a decision which we have made. Since the goal represents a scientific conclusion, a so-called fact, the political debate of this goal is not needed. Opponents are morally inferior. They're bad or bright. While supporters act with the authority of science and morale. As a consequence, policymaking is depoliticized. The necessary political negotiations do not take place. And an efficient climate policy carried by the whole society becomes impossible. On the side of science, climate science has identified a problem, namely anthropogenic climate change. Science can inform which climate effects are connected with which climate policy implementation. However, climate science is confronted with the claim that science would determine a policy which is without alternative and must be coercively implemented. Thus, science becomes a warrantor of a moralist conservative policy. Thus, a politicization of science takes place, which hinders an open and critical debate within climate science. The quality of climate science, in the sense of Kudos, is reduced. And if you think of a case some 30 years ago, what in Germany is called Waldsterben, then you know what I mean. So, so much on concepts, what is going on between science and uh, society. And now let's go to knowledge. Um, we usually use here the word science, I've used it also, even though I'm not convinced that this is really a good word. And I claim that the German word is considerably better, which is Wissenschaft, creating knowledge. And that's actually what we do. I don't know what science is. But the issue here is we are creating knowledge. And then, of course, the question, is there only one knowledge? No, it is not. There are a variety of knowledge claims. And also, this knowledge is not constant. It is developing. In time, therefore, we are creating knowledge. And so there are various ways of making sense of what happens around us in climate. And there's the present scientific construction, there's a dominant present cultural construction. I've spoken that before. Other cultural constructions, the skeptics, and outdated scientific constructions. Now I have to explain one thing. The word construction sounds a bit strange, maybe, for some of you. It does not imply that this process would be arbitrary or would be done with the intention of fraud or misrepresentation or other manipulative purposes. The term reminds of the fact that conclusions and new findings are built in consistence with earlier findings and understanding. So we construct it on a basis of something which is already there. We interpret new evidence in a way consistent with, with the basis. And that means we build something. And that's what means construction. Now let's talk first about the present scientific construction. And I would claim that within the scientific community, there is a consensus that there is a global warming which is inconsistent with internal causes. The technical term is detection. Thus, the warming needs an explanation with external causes. And only when greenhouse gases are considered a dominant driver a consistent explanation can be found. That's called attribution. And you could add at this time. The change manifests itself in the thermal regime in sea level rise and plausibly in more heavy rainfall events. However, many details are uncertain, such as the speed of rise of global sea level and of temperature. How quickly is it rising? The regional and local manifestations and the co-effect of different drivers say greenhouse gases, aerosols, land use change, including urban effects. 
This scientific construction of the anthropogenic climate change is broadly supported among climate scientists, documented by the IPCC. And I have here some uh, typical diagrams from the IPCC on the top left. Here, you see the temperature development of the global mean temperature for 10 year means and for individual numbers. And you see that there's a clear increase. Uh, in, in this was a mysterious uh, um, uh, hiatus, but uh, since then it went up again quite massively uh, clearly. Here we have the speed of uh, increase uh, all over the world. And you see there are some differences and there's even one area where we do not have a warming, very small, but by and large, it's everywhere getting warmer, even though at different speeds. And if we go then to this diagram here, let's just go for instance, I mean, it's too complex here to go into details. Let's just go for this diagram here. This is also from the IPCC and you see in black, the development of the temperature of land, uh, of uh, temperature over land. I mean, the other are similar. And these are 10 year averages. Now, if we go for a look now into various simulations with climate models and only use natural forcing factors or our best description of that, then we arrive at the blue band. You can see that the black curve is uh, here, is leaving the green, uh, the blue band. And you know, this is about something like 1960 or so. And so the black curve is inconsistent with the blue one. But if we tell the models, oh, there's also an anthropogenic effect, elevated greenhouse gases and so forth, aerosols, then we end up with a pink uh, band here and the black one is uh, in that band. And this is taken as evidence that we indeed uh, have a warming which needs explanation by these anthropogenic factors. But the assertion, the general excursion of the science is settled is misleading since many aspects of climate change are still in dispute. So for instance, the change in windstorms, this is still discussed. The speed of increase of sea level is still discussed. The future of ice bears is a matter which is contested. And then the frequency of health problems related to kidney stones is an open question and also the frequency of depression. Uh, Nature has just published something on the beer production in the future. I think that's also contested. So the statement the science is settled is at least misleading, if not outrightly wrong. Key elements are settled. Many are not. The most important ones are settled, but not the details. And in particular not because the science is settled. If an NGO comes and tells us that the storms in, in Northern Europe are getting worse in recent time, it's still not true. Even though they come with a big flag saying the science is settled. Now, the next one, the knowledge competition, uh, the dominant present cultural construction, the climate catastrophe. I have here the back cover of a book which was actually published in about 1990. And according to this construction, climate is changing because of human activities, not only de uh, uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, but also deforestation. And typical is the weather is less reliable than in earlier times. The seasons are unsteady, storms more violent, Climate extremes take on catastrophic, never seen dimensions. The factors leading to this change are related to, in this book, for instance, our greed and stupidity. Sometimes justice is a significant mechanism, sometimes the range of nature for human and environmental sins. I will come back to that. Uh, and sometimes these changes reflect God's, it should only one O, not goods, but God's wrath. And this climate catastrophe may be averted by keeping the change within the two degree limit. Reaching this goal depends crucially on the engagement of the individuals, for instance, abstinence of air travel, usage of bikes, vegetarian food, and good example for other people. We should be a good example, in particular for Chinese and Indian. And so here I have uh, an example. Uh, this is uh, Japanese, and I hope there are not, not too many here who can read it because I cannot. And uh, this is maybe uh, the whole trick of that. So what you see here is um, a, a person, and this person has a white coat, so it's a professor, right? This professor is telling us something about torrential rainfall, uh, a drought, and something I don't know what it should be. So this is drawn by somebody who's not from the coast, so you can see that. 
So he's speaking and explaining this, and he's explaining it to his listeners, which are children who are very much impressed. And then you see sinking islands and you see mosquitoes bringing malaria and other things. And then in the end, you see the professor in his white coat explaining people what to do. So the professor is explaining what to do. They don't have anything to say yet. They just listen. What should I do? Yes, I will do some answer. Um, here we have something, uh, this is in, in German, Austrian, so the climate catastrophe cannot be stopped. Europe 2100, it, it's all uh, desert, and um, we are here, so it's also not small. It's also not good. So this is a typical story which is told in the media. And so the Bild Zeitung wrote, uh, our planet is dying. That was also some 10 years ago. So this is the typical thing you read in the newspapers, what this is about. Now let's go to some cases here. We have here uh, the total losses per year from Atlantic tr tropical storms uh, uh, until um, uh, Katrina, 2005. And so you see there's a dramatic increase. And this was taken, say, from Munich Re or other, uh, other interested parties as proof is climate change. However, when you just think of what would have been the damages been if the coastline had been used in the same way in 2005, but already in 2028, then you get this curve. Of course, you can say, look for the details. But obviously, we had an increase in recent years. But compared to what we had in earlier times of the century, it was not particularly dramatic. The most severe storm was 20, 1928. That was the great Miami storm. But Miami was just a small, essentially, a village. A typical diagram, uh, which is shown here, you see here, Northeast Germany. So here are the Netherlands. And here are Schleswig-Holstein. You all know what Schleswig-Holstein is. Here's Bremen. And here you see what would happen if the sea level is rising by one meter then large areas would be flooded. I personally don't object if all would have been flooded, but um, so they, they would be flooded. However, we have to ask which areas are presently protected by coastal defense systems and which areas may be threatened if coastal defense fails. And here you have this, essentially the same diagram. What is supposedly flooded if the sea level is rising by one meter is exactly what is protected nowadays by coastal defense. Because if we would not have coastal defense, Emden would be flooded twice a day now. And I mean, these diagrams are just so tell us that people who make claims of that sort do not know what a coast is. Yeah, so without, it does not mean that sea level rise is not a serious issue, but the way it is spoken about it is misleading. So that is the common cultural construction but let, let's go to some other, such as Nature Strikes Back. By the way, here on the right-hand side, you see a wonderful article from The Guardian. So UK storms are divine retribution for gay marriage laws, is claimed. I mean, this is the typical thing. People have done something bad, and then come some superior forces and tell us, no, 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 you must not do that. I mean, the same way as Katrina was a sign that there's too much abortion in New, in New Orleans in the same way. But this type of argument, namely that higher powers use weather for punishing and giving direction, is very old thing. So this is nothing new, but this is a traditional way in Europe. Such weather, in particular catastrophe, would punish a sinful society and express a divine demand for religiously and environmentally sound life. Thus nature becomes a tool for us it's an indicator how bad the situation is, how sinful we are. So that's a very useful function, of course, for nature. So it is our system, warning system. And originally, of course, the high powers were gods. And nowadays, it's more often the environment, whatever that is. And here we have a, typical, a very nice example. This is this time in Swedish. So uh, nature strikes back. Uh, biology, this is from 19, 2002. You know, in the article, there's something saying the scientists are not quite sure what is going on here, but nevertheless, it's indication that blah, blah, blah. So it's a typical thing, at least in Northern Europe. The next block is what do skeptics say? They also have knowledge claims. 
And a large variety of perceptions exist according to which the dominant explanations about climate change and its anthropogenic sources are, as well as the dominant political solutions are flawed. So we made in our uh, now dormant web blog, Green Month People, some years ago, we asked people, I mean, there was a number of skeptics taking part, why, what is it you are concerned about? And then you see here uh, they, that uh, 356 people said the knowledge is insufficient for mitigation. Uh, then 120 said mitigation measures are wrong, and knowledge about climate system is wrong, and no answer. So if a certain view is there is no human driver behind the increase in greenhouse gas concentration. This is just happening. Second is that the temperature response to this increase is strongly overestimated. And finally, that the impact of climate change would be benevolent and hardly malevolent. I mean, it does not mean you could, if people accept the first thing, they don't need to worry about the other things. If they accept the second, they don't need to worry about the other two. The result is in all, all the time clear. You don't need to, get, to do mitigation measures. These perceptions share the conclusion that a massive mitigation of emissions is not needed. Instead, they claim that there's a hidden political agenda on socialization, uniformization, and surveillance society, which is pursued. So there's a conspiracy behind it, which uses a climate argument to make sure that certain political consequences are wrong. So the claim knowledge about climate system is wrong. So usually what happens is that key knowledge of classical scientific disciplines are not taken into account. For instance, geology. Geology has long shown that massive climate change is a common and recurrent phenomenon in Earth's history. And the present change would therefore nothing, be nothing new or alarming. It's a very frequently used argument. People don't see the fact that the issue is not warmth, but warming, which is a change which has a time dimension. So it's the, the speed of change which matters, not how warm it is. Is it? seemingly very difficult to understand for many people. Um, it is indeed the wording global warming is the right word. It is a fast change. If it takes place in 10,000 years, so don't worry. Now, they also claim that scientists would downplay existing uncertainties and alternative explanations would not receive the deserved attention. The funny thing is, when you look at uh, some of these counterclaims, then they are not associated with any uncertainties at all. So the norm, the best they say, you should be more critical to your own explanation is not applied to the own explanation. And, uh, but interestingly is skeptics share with alarmists the demand for authority of explaining and drawing societal conclusions. So both groups say, I know the truth and therefore I know what has to be done. Of course, Different things are to be done, but the mechanism, the authority, I can tell you what you are supposed to do, they share. They want to have scientists shall have interpretive dominance, the German word Deutungshoheit. That's really an interesting point because then we all others have nothing to say. So then knowledge insufficient for mitigation. So based on the alleged primacy of science over policy making, scientists inside would determine right or optimal solution. Scientists decide if a policy is good or not. And this is shared by alarmists. However, in democratic regimes, political conclusions are not determined by scientific conclusions, but only conditioned by scientific assessments of alternative options. So when scientists say, if you do this, then very likely you get that. Uh, it does not, scientists don't, should not say, you should do this. But if you do this, then you get that. Then you can choose what you want. And uh, pro political uh, propositions are determined by political preferences, which often are camouflaged as scientific necessities. We come to the next block, outdated scientific construction. And there's in particular the climatic determinism. And let's start with this interesting case here. You see here from a professor from Oxford University Press, Davis, who published about noses. Um, and so uh, on top, you see a so-called nose index from 
observations, what type of noses do people have in South Africa or in the Amazon or so? And then on the other hand, he said, this is directly related to climate, and therefore he derived his regression model about the climatic conditions all over the world and what the expected noses are. That's in the bottom. And you see, it is not perfect, in particular in China, yeah? but by and large, it is a good predictor for the type of nose. So noses are determined by climate. Professor, Oxford University Press, not Oxford University Press, sorry, Oxford University, 1923 to 1922. I mean, this is science, it was published, right? It sounds funny to us, but are you sure that people will not laugh in the same way about us in 100 years? It would be a little arrogant to say no. Anyway, so climate is a key factor determining the development of the fall of civilizations. By the way, why is, uh, did Rome fall? You know, you all know that, right? I mean, Rome was a pretty important thing. That is because they took down all the forests on the Iberian Peninsula and, and the outside to build uh, fleets. And this destroyed, so to speak, the climate. They made it dry. And then the foundation, the cyber foundation of Rome failed. And therefore, Rome is no longer that powerful, which made people in the 19th century, in the North, uh, say in, in Germany and England and so forth, quite nervous because they had all these reports about the wonderful high culture in, in Italy and Greece. And when they came there, they found out it's, it's somehow different now. And the explanation was the stupid Romans and Greeks have taken away their forests and have destroyed their own superiority. This is not fun, what I'm saying. I mean, this is not, I did not make that up. This was standard explanation some 150 years ago. Well, climate is not only uh, determining the development and fall of civilizations, it's also uh, responsible for the level of criminal activity, for the superiority of certain world regions, for societal violence, ability to learn and usage of libraries. So people in, in, in warm countries, they are, they are easily getting violent because they are somehow um, yeah, they, they are hot. Hmm? Everybody knows that this is so. And therefore, I uh, also find it very dangerous for me to be here in Italy. The theory was used as a legitimization of colonialism and is implicated in scenarios of contemporary climate change scenarios. Because if we speak about contemporary climate change scenarios, the only thing which is changing is climate, nothing else. And we think we can speak about the future of beer drinking only because we know how the temperature will change. This is just climatic determinism. What we, other things we do don't matter. Also, humans have to live in harmony with their climate. So uh, therefore, Scandinavians should move to Seattle, Washington DC, while uh, not to New Orleans, they would not survive there. I mean, these are not made up stories, which I'm telling you. But you should stay, in something which is similar to your climate. And any disturbance of this balance will lead to serious repercussions in the life of people and success of civilization. And here we have a pretty impressive diagram. This is by a guy with the name Alfred Huntington of Yale University, which is a pretty important university. And so he made the same thing as with the noses. So he has here uh, the, the distribution of civilization in 1916. And, um, uh, so he asked people, where do you think that uh, there's a high civilization? And then he also made something like a regression model of uh, temperature, rainfall, blah, blah, blah. And where would you expect, uh, where is the mental energy uh, given by climate conditions particularly high? And boom, it fits. You see, the top diagram is essentially the lower diagram. And this proves that it is the climatic conditions which is responsible for the level of civilization. This was accepted explanation for the inequality in the world some 80 years ago. So it, it, it sounds remarkable that, that people did that, thought that. It's of course explaining that we have, have helped, we have to help these people in white areas, which have no civilization at all and cannot have it because of insufficient climate. Uh, we have to help them somehow. And that means colonialism. Now, so we have a knowledge market. And, and, and if I would go out and, and ask people to what extent do you think this is right? 
unfortunately, we have never, I'm not aware of a study of that only for a case of students in Münster, Germany. And it turned out there was a quite a big support for this type of idea. So it's not dead. And I guess you also have heard that in your personal environment. So that why people are so have less success in Africa in the economic issues, it's because it's so nice life there. Yeah. Now, if we think about this knowledge market now, so the science policy, public interaction is not an issue, knowledge speaks to power. Various knowledge claims speak possibly to power or make power, but it's not so that there's one knowledge which is the absolutely true one, which is governed by, the, by science, which is telling the power what to do. It is also so that the public is neither stupid nor uneducated. If you hear about these sometimes uh, knowledge claims which appear strange to us, just move to a different topic which is far away from your own topic, say medicine. Which knowledge claims are you supporting? And I. To what extent are these cultural constructions in my mind when I speak about the different fields? I think it's quite probable that I do. So the public is not stupid, uh, uneducated, but has already an explanation. So the scientific knowledge is confronted on the explanation market with other forms of knowledge. And if we see this as a competition, there's no, not really a good reason why scientific knowledge should win this competition. I mean, if sometimes people think, scientists think that all what you need to do is you have to inform the public in a better way. That is something like you go there and write on the blackboard uh, the truth, believing that there is nothing on the blackboard so far. The blackboard is already full with explanations and you possibly can add a little character here and there, but you cannot just tell people, by the way, all what you thought in the past is wrong, all bullshit. It is instead this, this does not work out. And also it worked not out with yourself. So if the problem with science is presented as if it is a well-designed problem which needs one specific solution. And also the social process science is influenced by these other knowledge forms. We also know about this. And when we decide if a hypothesis is correct or not, we prefer those hypotheses which are consistent with what we believe in any case. And if we need, if we have new evidence, if something is contradicting my old views, then I need more evidence compared to a situation that the evidence is inconsistent with my prior beliefs. Now let's go to science and society, and I will jump over this and go then to the fathers of post novel science, Silvio Fundal with the Gerald, Jerry Roberts. And uh, so they started in 1986. It earlier to define the concept with name post normality. This is a situation when the state of science uh, is the state of science when facts are uncertain, values in dispute, stakes high, and decisions urgent. In this state, science is not only done for reasons of curiosity, but it's asked for a support for a preconceived value based agenda. And climate science is in a post normal situation. Let's just go through facts are uncertain. What is the sensitivity of global mean temperature doubling of CO2 concentration? We still think it's something between two and four degrees mostly, which was, was the first suggestion done already in 1970 when the first paper by NCAR and by Princeton uh, uh, GFDL came out. So they suggested two and four degrees, we are still there. Values in dispute. Do we cement the world according to our present preferences or do we accept the generationally dynamical development? We often say we want to leave a certain world to our children. Are we sure that our children want to have that? Do you think that you were happy with the world your parents left to you? It's very likely not. So if you want to leave a world according to your values to your children, they in the end may very well say, oh, I would have loved to have other children, have their parents. Stakes are high. Costs for reorganizing global energy market and future damages. These are high costs, so one. And decisions are urgent to be efficient. Reorganization uh, re of foreign traffic must begin now. 
So we cannot wait for the mitigation of that long term. So the characteristic for post-normal conditions is science is de-scientized, but politicized, and policy is depoliticized but scientized. Policy decisions are framed as being without alternatives. Scientific knowledge leads to unique solutions, which need to be implemented without further democratic influence on the substance. So, so to speak, we our opinion really does not matter. We don't need democracy. We can decide if we have blue cards or green cards or something of that sort, but not the substantial things. They are given, they are masks. And some scientists act as policy activists while exploiting their public authority as scientists. They claim to be scientists and act with the authority, but they pursue a value-based agenda. And then in this situation, we also have the emergence of different knowledge claims, among them alternative facts, and that's exactly what we see here. But if we think about a post-normal situation, it is not bad because we cannot change it immediately. So, but we need to recognize it as such. That is, we have to limit the scientific expertise to methodically sound call. We have to re-scientize science. science. We have to rely on what is demo really demonstrated. The evidence is robust and sound, not just way make wild claims. And we must also re-establish an openly value-based democratic decision process. We don't need to say we want to do this because science tells us, but we should say we want to do this because we want to do it. We think it's right. And not standing behind the scientist who says, you must do that. But climate scientists transgress into policy prescribing, even though in the IPCC cross it says it's not prescribing, but only relevant. And they do so regularly, and they do so uniformly in the same direction. And they trivialize social dynamics, and they may be interesting in this group here, and try to model the world, including the social sphere, as if its dynamics would be governed by a set of deterministic or stochastic equations. So national scientists usually do not understand social dynamics. Now, if you think about the topology of political and medial utility of climate sciences, so we have a center, so the Mitte here, sorry for that, which I would summarize under the name of honest broker, which is essentially meaning I'm telling you the options and what I can say these options would imply. It does not mean that I'm telling you all implications because many of the implications I don't understand. On the other hand, we have skeptics who say this is all bullshit. Thank you very much. And on the other hand, we have alarmists who say it's all disaster. We have nothing. We have no choice. We must do this. And they, both the skeptics and the alarmists are policy prescriptive. They say, I know what needs to be done. And I know it because I'm a scientist. If they're really scientists, doesn't matter. So the alarmists say they are part of the middle, and the skeptics, of course, say the same. But we have to think about a sustainable use of the resource science. So we need to prepare knowledge which allows societies and policymaking assessing the options and the effects on climate the options and the effects of climate, of climate policy. We need a quality management of science by making science an advisor, but not in determinator of policy decisions. So science tells, can tell policy making, if you do this, then you have to expect that in my field, but I can't tell you what happens in my neighboring field. And that may be significant as well, but I don't understand it. On the other hand, there's this concept of consuming the resource science by instrumentalization of scientific results for pre-chosen political agendas. That means patronizing the democratic process of forming a political will. And indeed, the word is sustainable here. Sustainable applies also to those who all the time speak about sustainability. Are they themselves acting sustainably? And I would say in most cases, not. Now they take home into summary and outlook. 
Climate science offers robust answers to the key questions of climate change, namely on the reality of warming, it is warming, the presence of external causes, and the attributing attribution of greenhouse gases as a dominant driver, dominant cause of change. It is getting warmer. We, it is not just a natural fluctuation, and the only way to explain it is with greenhouse gases. Other questions are still contested. It's a pretty trivial statement, right? But the last sentence is usually not given. Climate science supports the political process of the formation of a democratic will. The result of this process, however, what eventually comes out is a matter of social negotiation processes. It's not a matter of science tells you what to do. Science is indeed in the post-normal state with political actors claiming that their good case is coercively supported by science. We are hijacked, in other words. There's a market of knowledge claims which influence the understanding and deciding by stakeholders, the media and public. But the scientifically constructed knowledge does not necessarily win this competition. Skeptics and alarmists agree in their stance that science has to play the decisive role in taking politi political decisions. But I would claim that the center of the scientific community is beginning to fight against this appropriation of the interpretation of scientific results. In the media, however, mostly the extremists are present. So I could now speak about, if I still have two minutes? Yeah. Okay, so the survey we made. So end of the talk, sorry. So I, Sylvia was so kind to distribute this, uh, this uh, questionnaire and we had 31 responses. Mm -hmm. In one case, no, nothing was signed. It was empty. Oh, really? Yeah, so why not? Sure Mostly Italian. So uh, how convinced are you that most of the recent, uh, of recent that future of climate change is or will be a result of anthropogenic causes? And people could decide on a scale from seven to one and seven would be very much, and one would be not at all. So you could say five to seven is, is always saying, yes, I'm convinced, but I have a little bit or a little bit more slight doubts, but not, not really. And so you can see here that um, the choice seven was uh, taken in, uh, seven, in, in 70 percent. And then we have 20, I'm not sure, uh, who said gave a six and uh, one person also giving a five. So it's, I've never seen that before. You are really convinced that this is going and you have some minor doubts maybe, but essentially it says, no, this is clear. Okay. The next question is, is climate change mostly a political issue or a scientific issue? And I've here two families of red and black bars and the red bars is indicating it's a political issue, so the sum of them is much higher than the sum of the black bars. So most of you, or those who have participated in the survey, say, yes, this is a political issue. Science is no longer that interesting thing. But now comes the interesting part. What is the remaining task or the task of the climate community? Not of people in general also, or the Italians, but of the climate community in the future. And they could choose something between find out how things hang together, uh, in particular, uh, make sure which are the causes and mechanisms and all that. And this is called the attribution. Second part was, oh, work out what solutions we have for the problem. And the third one was motivating. So the main task of the scientific community is to motivate the public to act. And so the interesting result here is most of the respondents said the task of the scientific community is to motivate the public. That's an interesting statement, I would say. Um, is, it, is that so? I mean, obviously, most of you think that. Do you study that long for doing that? Are you educated for doing that? I don't know. I mean, that's a result. So uh, I think it's interesting to have this. I expected the attribution part would be the biggest. But this is my personal preference. So this brings me to an end. And 
so we have to tell jokes for another minute. So for another minute, yeah. Yeah, but, but I have no jokes, so then. <laughs> well, I can't. So I cannot move this away. So it does not move away. So. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, um, Professor. And um, I, I, during my introduction uh, with uh, um, very few seconds I had, I forgot to to say to invite you to visit uh, the website of Hans von Stork. You would find it very easily uh, via Google, uh, googling his name. And uh, in this website, you will uh, really find a number of uh, interesting uh, stimulating uh, uh, things, uh, information, references, uh, and also the list of all the achievements and uh, um, the outstanding the alleged things. Achievements. Uh, the alleged achievements. The alleged achievements of uh, her doctoral and professors and presentations, yes, yes. So now let's go on with the, um, with the seminar and I leave the floor to Roberto Pastres for his uh, Discussion. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to this event. And um, as uh, Silvia said, I'm a professor at Post University, but in ecology, I have a story which is a bit complicated. I started with chemistry and modeling of environmental, uh, of the fate of chemicals in the environment, but recently I switched my research focus on modeling of evolution of ecosystems. And of course, climate change is part of the game. Uh, I would like to thank you, Professor uh, Stoff, for this very interesting seminar. And there are lots of things that uh, I would like to ask you, but uh, I will leave myself to two, uh, let's say, questions that I think are, uh, are relevant. The, the first question is uh, going back to my background, in which I started the say rather probably the problem of uncertainty, propagation, and uh, assessment for ecological models. In, in the very first slides, you said that there is, uh, or you, you, you have a quotation which establishes a link between uncertainty and delegitimization. And can you explain this a little bit better? Because uh, on one hand, uh, um, the image of science as uh, uh, a mechanism which provides you an output, a solution, as you said, is a very old image of science which does not take into account uncertainty at all, which is pervasive in particular in ecology, biology, in the world of living things. And uh, on the other, uh, the delegitimization uh, is a risk that you run when you want to be scientific in providing your output because there is a large uncertainty. So, does this derive, uh, does this link derive from uh, an incorrect perception of science or from something else. The, the second question is a little bit more pragmatic. Um, I think that uh, there is a, a something, um, an, a link which was not touched in your, in your slides between policy and politics and science, which, is, which are the funding mechanisms. Um, I am coordinating a European project, H2020 project, as, as you probably were or are or will. And uh, when you look at the way you are, uh, let's say, strongly encouraged to present your, your project, you are asked by the, the Commission to have an impact. And in this impact, you have to include suggestions for policy makers. You, you, you can avoid that, but you are very likely to be penalized by the reviewers. So, what do you think about this thing? My, my, I have to say that I'm not at ease with this attitude of the European Commission. Because, the, in particular, in the Horizon program, which is the largest program, science seems to be at service of the now in the FBI are called the missions of the society, which are uh, to some extent uh, oriented by the politician or the policy. Yeah. So the uncertainty issue. Um, uh, 
So I'm supposed now to argue for, for Weinberg. Uh, this is a little bit difficult because I do not exactly what he means for that. But um, the link between certainty and uh, legitimization is certainly problematic because uh, if you say, if I'm certain about something in the scientific arena, then this legitimizes that I must do something specific. And if it turns out that indeed the certainty is not there, and you're also taking this argument away. But I would say uh, certainty and uncertainty has very little uh, to do with if one will do something in the end. As long as you say, well, it is my best estimate how it is, and to decide that I will take the risk of having making an error or something of that sort. So uh, we should be aware of uncertainty, but uncertainty is in general, in my opinion, not telling us that we should not act. I say this as a citizen, not as a scientist. Because if I have a limited evidence there, so it, sometimes decisions need to be done, and a non-decision is also a decision. The second point with the funding mechanism. So I'm not telling it, I'm not claiming that we are not making, doing, that we are not advising the policy process. I try to make this clear that we say, we can tell you that if we do this, then we get in this field of impact or whatever it is, political field, you get that effect. Um, so I can possibly say something, if I regulate something in, also in the environmental field, we will have that effect or believe to have that effect in the ecological system, but I can not necessarily also say what it would mean for some other field such as employment in the coastal region or whatever that is. So I cannot make a statement and I'm not, it, it's not because I'm stupid, but because it's simply too broad. So I can tell the policy making process uh, the, the expected expectations in my field of expertise are these, but certainly there are other fields of expertise that you should ask not only me, but you should also ask other scientists. In the end, you need to take a political decision. I remember vividly that we had a European parliamentarian at, a, at some conference, and she finally asked us, what should I do? It's not so much about the issue. Was. And I told her, you should do what you're elected for, you should decide. You have the responsibility. And you should hear what the experts say, but in the end, you have to decide. And so what often politicians do is they try to run away from their responsibility by saying, scientists told me I should do that, and therefore I'm doing it, I have no free will. This is not the case. In the end, politicians, and we are all politicians in that sense, voters, members of parties or whatever we are we have to take on our civic responsibility and take our own decisions we should be informed by science and science should say yes we inform you but it cannot take the form of we take a decision for you and it may be that this is sometimes so in brussels but on the other hand the brussels people can't stand if other people take decisions for them so don't worry they will not listen to an advice which is not welcome they will only listen to those advices which are welcome, which are consistent with their own expectation. But this is certainly a problem with the funding mechanisms that there's always this outreach thing. And in most cases, what is suggested in these outreach blocks is just naive, silly stuff. Completely useless lip service and no thinking at all and hardly any uh, understanding of the social dynamics is, is present there. So I find it simply stupid in most cases. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Okay, now um, we can proceed with um, questions, both from the audience That's and uh, from the web. If um, there is some question, I'm uh, okay. I see a number of and raised. Okay, uh, many many questions also from the web. I think. Uh, Hi, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I was curious about the post normalities, right? You said that a post normality is not bad per se, but uh, that we should, in a way, uh, requires, uh, requires recognition. And one of the two recognition was to limit the scientific expertise to the technologically sound core. Yeah. And I wonder if it's actually a good choice or not. Sometimes having new methodological proposal can be actually. 
great value added to scientific uh, community in general. So I would be curious if you can elaborate a bit more on that point. Thanks. So maybe I miss, I, I did not express my very well here. So for the scientific debate within the scientific community, then of course we should try all strange things. But if we communicate to the public and derive conclusions for what to do, then we should make sure that we limit ourselves a little. But within the scientific community, please be as crazy as you can be. But the next step is that you jump then to the conclusion that you should do, I'm not sure what, don't use lipsticks anymore. So I would say this is maybe not totally useful. Okay, now, now I pick a question from, uh, from the web, from uh, the people following the webinar. Here there is Anna Taylor who is asking, is the IPCC in its current form the best model we have for mediating the science policy politics interface? If not, how would you suggest it is redesigned? Yeah, thanks for this question. So, um, if, if I have only uh, very few words, then I would say yes, even though I don't like the word best. So it would be good enough if it's good. Um, and then there are certainly a few things we, what one could improve. We actually had, uh, we prepared uh, the three uh, versions of a mini IPCC, a regional IPCC, namely for the Baltic Sea region, for the North Sea region, and for the greater Hamburg area, where we tried to summarize uh, what we know about climate in these fields, in which are documented in, 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 in uh, scientific legitimate uh, publications. And we also try to identify gaps and uh, issues where, which are still open. So that could possibly be done a bit better with the IPCC. And I wonder if the last report, the 1.5 degree uh, report, was uh, really at the same standard as what we have seen before. So. It, I mean, the National Science part, I think, was pretty obvious, but then the these decisions that we could arrive, we still can meet the 1.5 degree limit. I'm not sure how much evidence there was. It, it was also, at least when we, in the public communication which took place, nobody was really very explicit about the fact that we would need a massive taking out of CO2 from the atmosphere. And that must be a technical solution. And just imagine that you want to have big piles of, of uh, CO2, you know, carbon in Germany. You can imagine what happens if that is planned. People tried to have CCS in Germany and it was stopped because the public was not accepting it. And so I can't see how this should be done globally. But in principle, the IPCC is a very valuable process. And, uh, but, but one must make, sure, of course, sure that it does not depend too much on people, that we are not forming a new elite. I mean, we have quite a few authors who have been uh, authors in all reports, or many author, uh, reports, and some think they deserve to be an author because they are smarter than others. So these are all things where we could improve the IPCC process quite a bit. I would throw out almost all IPCC authors of the last round and get new ones. And new ones, and new ones. Maybe keep one quarter or something like that. Okay, another uh, there's a question here. Also one in front here. Sorry, I have a question. Can you maybe give us some examples of the work that you were doing or are doing with the social scientists? And also the role that you're having in the social science department in Hamburg. Uh, I understood that you asked uh, to what extent am I personally involved in social science projects and what my role in Hamburg was. So let, let me answer the first, the last question. So I became a member of the uh, Faculty of Social Sciences in recognition of the fact that when we build uh, center of excellence of climate sciences that we have a significant component uh, in this uh, center of excellence by social sciences. It's something like one third now. And uh, that was mainly because I pushed for that, that we need this type of contribution. So uh, on the other hand, 
I'm working, uh, I've worked with uh, several social scientists, uh, me usually as a junior partner, say on this post normality, on the history of climate catastrophes, on the perceived history of climate catastrophes, on uh, 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 historically earlier cases, uh, that is the climatic determinism part of Huntington, or it would also be the uh, Eduard Brückner case. So these type of things. And we also made regularly surveys among climate scientists what they think about climate science uh, and the, the role of climate scientists in the public domain. Then uh, this, I mean, if you're more interested in that, I'm, I'm happy to supply you with, with papers, of course, uh, but you would also find that on my webpage if you look through that. So there is another question here in the, in the mean. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, so I'll do it very short. Yeah. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, what's a new opinion that made the key drivers of climate policies to do to scratch on areas like scientific knowledge and public opinion and other interests? And what 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 creates climate policies? This that's a very good question, which is something like a shorthand. I have not a good answer. So I would I have not really thought about it. But it's a very legitimate question. And I would guess it's to some extent, of course, it is the results of science, which is telling us that there's something going on, but there's it's more to it. So that this is really getting so much um, momentum. So I would also get that elements of climatic determinism are involved in that. So without basic concepts that we must live in harmony with our climate, and if we move to a different climate or the climate is changing uh, where, where we are, that this should be have disastrous consequences, that uh, also for our well-being, I would expect that this is also quite significant. And if I would be allowed spontaneously to uh, set up a research project in this direction. Then I would make a survey uh, among the, uh, uh, the members of the uh, conference of the parties what they think about climatic determinism. And I would expect that a large number of people would maybe at least tacitly support that. But I don't know that. And I think it's a very good question. And I would welcome it very much if somebody is thinking systematically on that. So thanks for the idea. Maybe you will pursue it yourself. So, and I would like to hear it. In order to keep a balance between the questions asked uh, from the audience here and from the web, now I read another question from the web from Marcus Leitner, who ask, asks, um, how about applied climate change adaptation science this shall provide option for decision to be taken related to specific questions. Is this still science in the way you explained it? Um, I, yes, I would say yes. So it's a, a significant, this is a significant field. So we must deal with that. I mean, mitigation has, is operating differently than adaptation. Mitigation means we have we better do, decide it now, because what we do not decide now, we can never reach again. Adaptation should be done, on the other hand, can be done later. And the trick is that several things change for adaptation. One is the physical state or the biochemical state. Then the knowledge about this change, we know more in 10 years time, and the preferences change and the technological opportunities change. So we should postpone the decision to the extent possible. And so it, it functions a little different. Uh, but on the other hand, there are also, of course, the case of misuse. We have snake oilers. So uh, people who sell snake oil against all kinds of diseases. Uh, so uh, in many cases, uh, 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 municipalities need uh, told that they should provide for an estimate what is the risk for flooding and, and God knows what, and uh, are they prepared for that? And then, of course, they can't do that themselves usually, so they hire a company. 
it, could you do it a little cheaper, please? And then they, these companies write something. And they really have no idea about that. But the formal necessity for the municipalities is fulfilled. And so I'm not good at setting up companies, but maybe I should. <laughs> so it's the snake oiling. So that people show up and say, I'm an expert, trust me. I will tell, and I will tell you how you can do that cheaply. You know, that is a, a problem in adaptation studies. And so we also there, we should make sure that we arrive at a very solid uh, basis. And so we have also these social constructions that some people tell all the time that we have to expect the sea level rise uh, to, to be two meters at the end of the century or maybe seven meters. That sounds great, but uh, maybe it's not that realistic. Okay, one question here in from Giovanni Cecconi and Venice Resilience Lab uh, Linkman are involved in this field of social literacy here in the Instagram. I, I am interested in the media and how the co exploration, co production can help into achieving this goal of uh, connecting, bridging science with programs, uh, so in this uh, building of knowledge. What is the role of of science and uh, media together. I think that science and media are different social actors. They have different roles. And so, first of all, deciding about what to do with the pers perspectives we have is a matter of democratic decisions. Of course, we can do stupid things. I mean, uh, but even at, at least in the German constitution, there's there's no statement saying stupid political decisions are forbidden. This is not the case. So the public may decide stupidly. But in the end, the public has to decide. And this is the only legitimation we have. It's a public democratic decision. And we should keep that in mind. And if we then say, but let's try to bring in as much uh, constraining knowledge. So in the sense, if you do this, then you get that. Uh, but not only one field, uh, that would be good. And the media, of course, can, uh, if, if the public says, yes, that's a good model we want to adopt, that we want to know what are the possible implications in a broad range. And then on the basis of this, we will take a decision. It is our responsibility to take this decision. And of course, it would be good if the media tell us about this, but we also must keep in mind there are values in this decision. And we should be explicit about that. And media often represent also values, which is legitimate and good. I mean, we have, I guess, we have a, a more conservative channels and we have more leftist journals, newspapers in Germany, at least. And that's okay. That's what we expect. And so, um, and sometimes they oversell. That's also part of the story. And, and most of us know that. But in principle, I would say, if the media tell us it's us who decide, and we should inform ourselves before we decide, we should inform ourselves in the whole breadth of issues and not allow some smart people to say, trust me, I'm a doctor, and you should do what I tell you. That is maybe the main task in, in these times where democratic uh, traditions are less favorable, treated in some countries or in many countries, but maybe in China. Okay, last question probably, because we are very late. For the responsibility. Very much of what, of what we've been talking about, what we've been can, can talking you, to us. Can you speak a little bit? But louder. Louder. Uh, very much of what you have been talking to us and what has been discussed really revolves around somehow the so called concept of fact based decision making, uh, which has a lot to, to say of the interaction between people, politics, science, and so on. Now, the problem, of course, arises how should people decide? If decisions are, have really been, are really being taken on facts, uh, and, and if, if, if the facts are really true, because people can say, I take decisions on facts, yeah. but then it can either be false or the facts can be false. 
Now, does this somehow tell us that we need higher level or better level of, of scientific education in people so that they can decide by themselves whether facts are facts or or or, or or do they have to rely on different methods of decision rather than knowing by themselves? I presume it's the latter. So first of all, so in, in many cases, it is not that, so to speak, the facts are unclear, but I would say sometimes they're contested, but usually they are incomplete. You have, there are certain fields which are affected by your decision, which are not covered by the facts. But only certain aspects are covered by the facts. And so you know that there's a certain area of gray zone where your facts don't matter, but your decision has an influence on. And therefore, the idea that I would have enough facts to decide, yeah, I must take this. I mean, in certain cases, it may, may be so. But uh, in, in, uh, in most cases, I would expect, no, this is not so. It's still a, 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 a thing of judgment in the end. And uh, again, in the, in the uh, Constitution, nobody says judgment must be reasonable. It should be. I mean, I would prefer to have that. But in the end, uh, the way how we decide has something to do with the social peace we have in the country. To what extent we can work together, we trust each other, that we arrive at the conclusion, yes, we can arrive at joint decisions, even though I prefer more that decision and you more that, but somehow we come to an agreement. But if if I'm standing up and saying, you're stupid, if you don't understand things, uh, be quiet, I'm deciding now. This is the death of social uh, the, uh, the peace uh, for thing. So th that's at stake in my personal view. I mean, I'm not saying this as a scientist, but I'm just saying this as a personal per Yeah, it's a person. Uh, and I'm smart, by the way. I'm, that's true. I mean, you should all <laughs> not have any doubts. I'm, I'm really very, very intelligent. Um, I, I would conclude you all. With, with the very, very last question from the web. And um, the question is, do you have uh, um, any insights on how to facilitate building of frames around climate change that extend beyond climate science to include implications such as social justice and poverty, so that to share a bigger picture of implications with the public and other actions section? No. Okay, <laughs> very quick answer. And, um, it's a good question, but I don't have an answer. I mean, that's it. Very good. So I think uh, we can uh, close here. We are already very late. Uh, thanks again to Professor Hans for talk. And just uh, before closing, just a quick reminder of the next uh, CMCC seminar webinar, which is projecting demand for food, energy, and other materials to 2060 which will be held on October 30, 2018 at 12.30. And um, the presenter will be Elisa Lanzi and the moderator, Enrica De Chan. You can read uh, the affiliations. And so thank you again. Uh, for the and uh, thank you for all who attended uh, this very interesting webinar. I'm, Really sorry because there, there are tens of uh, very interesting questions, but uh, unfortunately, time is over and we have to close here. Thank you. Yes.